First of all, thank you for tuning in to my presentation. Uh, my name is Jamie Wolcott. I am the director of LMI at MIR. Uh, and I've been with MIR for a little less than a decade. And um, in that time, I've had the privilege of looking into Canada's mining labor market. Uh, so that means exploring uh, the key issues, finding where their uh, labor market is not necessarily performing up to its full potential, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so, like we do for all mere presentations, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm delivering this presentation today on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin, uh, Huron, Wendat, and Anishinaabe uh, nations. So, for this presentation, there will be a Q&A at the end uh, of the presentation. So, if you have questions, please use the Zoom uh, Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the, your Zoom window there. And uh, we'll get going on the on this uh, presentation now. So today I want to share with you some of the analysis and content that we have been producing at MIR. Uh, notably, uh, we're going to be looking at the impact of COVID-19 on Canada's mining labor market. So here's the plan for this presentation. So first, for those of you who do not know who MIR is, I will give a brief introduction uh, to our organization. Second, uh, we're going to be looking at the impact of COVID-19 on Canada's mining labor market. So that's going to cover, first of all, what happened in the mining sector during this event, who has been disrupted uh, in particular, and then we're going to look at how does uh, COVID-19 compare with other recent historical events. And then finally, we're going to look at what, what comes next in, in terms of the future. And so after we get through some of that, I'll show you um, a new labor force development dashboard tool that we've recently created. And I'll, I'll walk through a little bit of a demo on that. So that's the plan. So first is all about MIR. So MIR is a nonprofit organization that uh, collaborates across mining, uh, Canada's mining industry. Uh, among its objectives include understanding labor market trends and identifying uh, opportunities uh, for developing human resources solutions. MIR has a 15 person board of directors, uh, which includes mining employers, associations, organized labor and post-secondary institutions. And uh, in uh, our operations, uh, MIR has four strategic pillars. The focus of today is gonna be on the labor market pillar uh, or LMI pillar. So uh, under that pillar, we've been fairly busy as of late. We've uh, produced a lot of uh, publications. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be sharing insights from uh, one of those, uh, which is a labor market study uh, that covers the impact of COVID-19 on, on Canada's mining labor market. And so this project was originally going to be all about the downsides of labor market volatility. Uh, so we were going to look at the costs of losing people to other industries. Uh, and, and the cost of having to attract people, new people into the industry uh, versus uh, sort of maintaining a healthy labor supply. But then COVID-19 hit. And obviously that was such a big event that it only made sense that we reshuffle our priorities and refocus effects on the mining sector. Uh, so the objective of, of what we've done uh, in this study is to first examine, you know, what happened uh, as a result of COVID and then where is the mining labor market headed in a uh, post COVID-19 world. Um, and I just like to say that, you know, the long term implications of this pandemic are still not clear and probably will not be cl clear or transparent for many years. Uh, so this, you know, this project was uh, very challenging to pin down. Uh, the way I would describe it is uh, like assessing the damage of an earthquake while the earthquake was still happening. And as we all know, this uh, pandemic is still a factor in our daily lives in 2021, and its implications will likely go beyond that. So if I had to summarize this into a few words, they would be these three shock, recovery, and turbulence. And I'm gonna show a couple slides that paint this picture so you can see what I mean. Uh, so before we do that, I, the first thing we need to do is just establish a timeline. So you may be familiar with this picture. So this is the 
daily new cases up to January. Uh, and this gives us a good representation of a timeline for this pandemic. Obviously, the timeline continues to evolve and, uh, and will you know, evolve past this time and obviously uh, look very different depending on the future uh, uh, that uh, is not in this picture. But looking back on the year 2020, we have broken this down into distinct phases. So we have pre-lockdown, uh, first wave lockdown, et cetera. And this is helping us establish a time frame for this analysis. So how has this major event translated into the mining labor market? So in to, to investigate this, we had to revisit several labor indicators um, and, uh, and kind of crack open uh, you know, things that we thought were stable and, and view what the pandemic. So this is the unemployment rate in mining and quarrying in, in NAICS 212. So what you see here is that economic shock showing up in the unemployment rate just as the first wave lockdown started. So unemployment went up to about 18%, which is the highest recorded number we have going back to the 80s. Uh, so there's your shock. Uh, recovery begins to happen fairly quickly after that. Uh, and we've heard from many people uh, in the industry that a big part of this recovery uh, happened when mining was deemed an essential service by several provinces. So you see that number fall back down. So there is your recovery. But then you have this thing that we're calling turbulence. So what do I mean by that? Turbulence essentially means that things uh, have been off balance and we're trying to figure out what the new normal is going to be. And uh, that is what we've been seeing after this initial shock and recovery period. So overall, we did not fall off a cliff, uh, but there has been some disruption. Um, and this can be seen across many indicators and it's a familiar pattern after you see an initial shock, then you see a recovery, and then you see a, a, a new uncertainty, a, a phase of new uh, unknowns. So let's look at uh, the unemployment level in mining and quarrying. So you have your initial shock in April uh, that's about, that takes us from 65,000 workers to about 55,000 workers. Uh, and then compared to the uh, three previous years, we see that the recovery has been somewhat sluggish and prolonged. And this is what we're calling turbulence. So the big takeaway here is what is in this turbulence phase? So despite having a report to publish, uh, we're, we're continuing to monitor uh, this, this uh, period and exactly what has ha been happening as we've entered uh, new lockdowns, uh, you know, uh, the vaccine deployment, these new events that sort of uh, continue to evolve the pandemic event, uh, we keep monitoring these, uh, these variables. So that uh, sort of summarizes or lightly touches on uh, the what happened section of this presentation. Obviously there are more variables that we uh, have covered in our study, uh, but those are just the two uh, uh, high, higher level ones. So um, have a look at that. Um, but we've also asked in this presentation, uh, who has been greatly disrupted by the pandemic? Uh, so we did this for several dimensions. So we looked at uh, different regions, provinces, occupations, demographic groups, I won't have time to show all of them, but I did find this picture rather interesting. This is looking at the unemployment rate in a few mining related sectors uh, by quarter, and it goes back to 2001. Now it may be hard to see, but the orange represents 2020. The gray is all preceding years, starting with 2001. And the uh, blue dashed line is a seasonal prediction based on the historical data uh, that we've produced. So uh, there's two things that uh, they are rather interesting here. So first is 2020 is clearly an anomaly across the board. Uh, we haven't seen this high this century. And so that's the first interesting thing. The second is uh, support services. So uh, that's the uh, one in the middle there. Uh, so this particular sector has clearly suffered the most through 2020. Uh, and in, in uh, that uh, Q2, uh, unemployment went up to 23% and has hovered above 10% in Q4. 
those are very high numbers considering we would have predicted about 5% in Q4 without COVID. You can also see other covers, uh, other uh, sectors have uh, begun to uh, recover a little bit to some extent, yet the uh, support service sector had the largest spike and has remained relatively high. So that's, uh, that's one uh, area that we flagged uh, under, the, under the topic of who has been disrupted. Uh, this is the same exact picture, but now we're looking at educational attainment. So the big takeaway here is the impact on those with no or diploma. And that's uh, the second from left picture there. Uh, and obviously this picture shows how that uh, 2020 has been a tough year for them. Uh, and you can see other groups uh, you know, be, have begun to narrow that recovery gap uh, and they have uh, you know, begun to become looking more normal. Uh, yet uh, those with no uh, diploma or degree uh, have gone and their unemployment rate has taken off to unprecedented levels. 23% uh, as, as high as Q4 in 2020. So uh, again, we're looking at who has been disrupted. Um, continuing with this theme of who has been particularly uh, disrupted by the pandemic, we're also looking at exposure to the virus in the workplace. So this picture illustrates the occupational risk from the COVID-19 virus. Uh, so we were inspired by the World Economic Forum. And in April of 2020, they put together something that was similar to this. They came up with a risk factor that measures three things. One is contact with others, physical proximity, and exposure to uh, disease and infection. And they aggregated this into a uh, COVID-19 risk score uh, that goes between zero and 100, so zero being the lowest risk and 100 being the greatest risk. So we have taken their model and we, and we took their model and translated it uh, into the mining industry. So this picture here focuses on 107 mining relevant occupations. You have your risk score on the uh, vertical axis there. And then we have the number of workers uh, in each occupation on the horizontal axis. So a higher score uh, signals to us which occupations uh, should be taking the most precautions uh, to avoid a potential infection. Uh, so this chart uh, also highlights several uh, production occupations that have both a moderately high risk score and a high share of workers. And so we're saying these are the occupations that, that are flagged as having uh, the potential most workplace dis disruption resulting from the virus. So moving on. So, so thus far we talked about what happened. We also talked about who's been disrupted. But now how does this pandemic event stack up to other recent uh, historical events? Uh, so this picture shows the employment data for mining and, and quarrying, and that's in blue. And then uh, the support services sectors, so that's in red. Uh, we have uh, pointed to several other historical events. Uh, so you can see the 9-11 attacks, uh, the 2008 financial crisis, we flagged the peak of the commodity super cycle that happened in the 2010 decade. Um, those gray areas also highlight uh, uh, recessions, uh, uh, consecutive periods of GDP contraction. Uh, so this gives us a perspective uh, of the COVID-19 event. And we can say the COVID-19 event does not register very much in the noise of employment movements over time in the mining sector. It does register a little bit in the support service sector, and you can see that there has been a significant drop in, during the COVID event. Um, but this sector overall is uh, definitely more cycle driven and more volatile. And so the COVID drop is not one that is unprecedented. Where the COVID-19 uh, uh, factor does show up is in the seasonal employment patterns. And I'm gonna show that so this chart again shows 20 years of employment data. Again, mining and quarry left uh, and all industries is on the right. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, growth patterns in a typical season. So each dot in this, in this 
picture uh, measures the change from three months prior. And we can see how the workforce tends to expand in the summer months and contract in the winter months. Uh, highlighted here is those orange dots. So that's 2020. The orange dots represent 2020. And this illustrates how 2020 was not a typical year. And this comes back to that idea of turbulence. It looks, it looks a lot like uh, we were scrambling as these seasonal patterns appear as though they were not completely, or they were not regard, uh, they were disregarded in 2020. And that shows up uh, in the mine sector and, and in the uh, total industry sector, you can really see how much of an outlier 2020 was uh, and how it, it really uh, crashed during those first lockdown phase and, uh, and, then, uh, and then recovered thereafter. We've also uh, revamped our uh, employment forecast for this study. Uh, so in our, um, in our report, you'll find an employment forecast uh, right after you get through uh, about, a, about a page of disclaimers. Uh, so obviously we're dealing with a lot of unknowns at this stage uh, and you have to take forecasting uh, more as and less of a prediction of the future. So uh, I just want to stress this, that we, there's a lot of fundamental things that we don't know. Uh, how behavior has changed uh, in terms of recruitment, uh, hiring needs, uh, the shift to remote work is, is a, has been a very big deal in 2020. We also don't know how this has accelerated technology and innovation uh, in the mining sector. Uh, you know, certain technology in the works and COVID just really pushed them forward. Uh, and we're, we're not sure how that, that, that's gonna impact on our forecast. Um, we also don't know uh, the regulatory environment and how new regulations may monetary policy. These are things that would impact our forecast. And uh, in, in many ways, they're, they've been, they're on a new track versus before the pandemic. Despite all that, we have offered this forecast as a way to explore the possibilities. So this is a five-year forecast. Uh, we had it at 10 years. The second uh, scenario is showing an optimistic uh, scenario. So that's in green. Sorry, I, I heard some technical difficulties in the background and I, I think we're, we're, back, we're back on track here. So just to pick it up, uh, uh, the uh, old scenario is in yellow, the optimistic scenario is in green, and this is going to assume that uh, the pandemic was mostly a blip and that we are quickly gonna return to normal thereafter. Uh, and when we look back on the pandemic, it, it was mostly in, an immaterial uh, and, and issue. And the final scenario is uh, the pessimistic scenario. And so that's in purple there. And that assumes that there is no going back and that the changes that we see are more or less permanent and we are settling into uh, a new normal uh, that, uh, that's going to equate to a lower level of employment indefinitely. So that, I just want to say that this is it. Uh, this picture is in our uh, COVID-19 study. I do want to uh, pivot to uh, talk about how this factors in in, in, the, in the big picture here, because in spite of these forecasted scenarios, there are longer term concerns that have uh, been prevalent before COVID and that will continue uh, to uh, more or less undermine the mining industry's labor supply. So this is an example I'd like to show, and it's uh, uh, showing um, uh, issues with attracting youth and incoming students into mining relevant disciplines. So this is a recent poll that was conducted by uh, Abacus Data, and it shows that mining was the least choice among those aged 15 to 30. Uh, so the reason why I'm showing this is this is an issue whether there is a pandemic or not. And this sentiment is also showing up in our post-secondary system. So this is enrollment in uh, engineering programs. 
Uh, the three most mining centric uh, programs are mining, metallurgical, and geo geological. And those also happen to be the ones with the lowest enrollment share. And you can see that here. And, uh, and on the right side, uh, I isolated those three to, so, so you can see the scale of it. You can see enrollment in those three have been falling. Um, and you can see that trend on the right side. So overall, there is uh, more work to do uh, to make mining a uh, competitive option for students. Um, and again, these trends go beyond the direct impact of COVID-19. And they, uh, they definitely represent longer term concerns that have not that have sort of been independent of, of the other issues. Okay, so that is that covers uh, our COVID uh, analysis. Um, and uh, now I'm going to talk about dashboards. So I promised at the on the onset of this presentation, I promised that I would introduce a new uh, tool that we've been uh, that we have produced. So uh, let me just give you a brief intro to that. So Mir has been producing labor market in information for about a decade. And over that time, we have mostly relied on uh, static reports uh, to share our content and analysis. Uh, lately, we've noticed that this does not always make sense. Uh, some information is more engaging and useful in it when it is uh, provided in a more interactive format. So this year uh, and beyond, uh, we wanted to elevate how we are sharing information. So this means making LMI more accessible. Uh, we want the data to be more timely and we want it to have a regional focus. So therefore we are piloting a dashboard and uh, this is a new way to explore and access Mirror's LMI. Uh, so we're planning on building on this uh, uh, pilot in the future. Our LMI dashboard is gonna be updated monthly and uh, I've made I've made a video, a brief demo to walk you through the co content of this dashboard. I'm gonna click on that and uh, I'm gonna see you on the other side of this video. And uh, let me just do that. Okay. Welcome to Mirror's interactive dashboard. I'm gonna be walking through some of the features and some of the views that can be found here. So this dashboard has uh, three main views. Uh, so this is the first uh, view, uh, and this provides an overview of mining trends in Canada and across the provinces, and we've been calling this the executive view. Uh, so this is going to give you uh, various uh, statistics uh, related to the mining labor market, uh, and it's going to be updated on a monthly basis. So at the top here, we can see see a current snapshot of uh, Canada's mining industry by uh, mining projects, uh, mining schools, and here's a little summary right here. Below that, we can see a few uh, relevant statistics related to uh, uh, Canada's mining industry. So we have the number of employed, uh, unemployment rate, uh, wages, and uh, a variety of demographic statistics there. So below this uh, view, below this snapshot, we have a two-year uh, window of uh, what the trend has been, basically, for those uh, variables. So here we see how employment levels have moved, uh, unemployment rate, uh, and as we go down, some of the various demographic uh, representation statistics. Um, speaking of which, I get uh, uh, requests for information on these demographic statistics uh, almost on a weekly or monthly basis, uh, and and it's always it's always in in this sort of form. What is the representation among uh, a, a specific group uh, in the mining sector in among mining employment? And so that these are here and, and they're very uh, useful to to share uh, at this stage, and we can see how they've been moving. Another interesting factor is, is uh, the COVID-19 factor. We've already discussed COVID-19 in this pre presentation, uh, but it's really interesting to see how it shows up in these pictures and, and it, it has. Uh, so for example, uh, if we look at indigenous 
share of employment of mining employment in Canada, we see how uh, how it fell basically in in uh, those early lockdown uh, times uh, in April, and then it recovered uh, after that. Uh, we also see uh, immigrants, interestingly, have uh, done very well, or they did very well during those COVID months, and then they uh, leveled off after that. So. Uh, just a few things I thought thought was interesting that uh, popped out of this uh, of the, these views that as we were building uh, this dashboard. Uh, the other thing I would like to note is is at the top here you can filter by province. So if we click on uh, British Columbia here, and it will filter all those very same statistics with uh, with the view of British Columbia. So uh, here we have have now BC stats, BC map. And BC trends down here, so we can see what happened in BC, how it may be different, uh, what unique thing has uh, popped out of here, and you can see there's interesting, there's interesting things. I, I catch myself looking at these a lot, actually. Um, so that's the uh, so that's the first view, uh, the monthly report. Moving on to the second view. Uh, so the second view. Uh, is an occupational view. So this gives you an occupational lens and allows you to compare about across provinces. Uh, so this is going to again show you those labor market statistics that were covered, uh, but for a given occupation, and I set this to uh, uh, heavy duty and mechanics here. Uh, so this is we're looking at heavy duty and mechanics in this in this uh, view right now. Uh, and uh, and it gives you a, a bit of a comparison. So I guess uh, I highlighted Alberta because let's, for example, let's let's say you're in Alberta and you're looking for a, he a heavy duty mechanics. Uh, so this, you know, we can see here that how that stacks up, how that compares across provinces. In Alberta, you have a sizable uh, uh, share here, a sizable market given by the size of the workforce. Uh, but you also have a very low unemployment rate, and, and you can see that there, the unemployment rate in Alberta for heavy mechanics is very low. There's also a wage premium in Alberta, so you're going to be forking over the highest wages uh, for this occupation in that province. So these things suggest to us that this market is rather tight, and we may have a high competition uh, for talent and talent may be harder to find and we may have to expend resources there. Um, so just to contrast that in New Brunswick, we have a, a bit of a different story. We have a, a bit of a smaller uh, marketplace, but we have a uh, rather higher, uh, higher level of unemployment. So uh, that suggests a, you know, a, a much more relaxed slacker market. We also have lower wages. So there may be some opportunities there if we can, uh, if we can leverage that, even though there, there's an overall smaller market size in, in that province. Uh, so you can also see uh, in this view, other demographic characteristics, uh, and we're comparing them. And in this uh, occupational category, uh, Alberta is still highlighted. Uh, and we can see that, uh, in these other uh, characteristics that Alberta is roughly in line with other provinces. Uh, the only maybe exception is indigenous representation. Alberta is doing a, a certainly better. It's at roughly 15 percent and uh, uh, Canada overall is, is you know roughly around 5 percent. Each one of these bubbles represents a province and Canada is the biggest bubble and you can see how how these things are, are distributed across across provinces, how these statistics uh, compare. So uh, that is the third, uh, uh, sorry, the second view. So the third and final view offers a more granular picture for regions across Canada. So again, this is an occupational view. So you can select the occupations that are most relevant to you and you can select them in this drop down menu here. Um, and the main objective of this tool in this view is to help us identify opportunities for recruitment and labor force development. So here we have a map of Canada and it's showing uh, economic regions across Canada. Uh, darker colors correspond to the high, a higher density 
of uh, whatever indicator that we are interested in. And those, those indicators are, are in the drop down here. So currently we have selected number of employed. Um, and on the right side, we've ranked the top regions according to, uh, you know, what is trending right now. So what is, what are the hottest regions in terms of, of, of uh, employed? And what are the most, uh, the not trending regions, the negative ones? Uh, and you can see that here. Um, below, you can see uh, a distribution view. So where does uh, each uh, region rank uh, and compare according to uh, all other regions? Um, so in this case, you can compare the performance relative uh, to other regions in Canada. Uh, so let's say, for example, you're looking for civil engineers um, across Canada. So I click on civil engineers and uh, the, the map will update to show which uh, regions across Canada uh, show where there's a higher concentration of civil engineers. So here we can see it's the major cities uh, something that is rather obvious if you think about it. Major cities uh, ha are where we'll, we're more likely to find uh, this uh, occupational category. Um, we can also click on the map and and uh, to sort of uh, select uh, that, and we can see down here how that compares. So here's civil engineers uh, on the spectrum. It's relatively higher if we click on the lower mainland, which, which is the region that I. I clicked on there. So um, you can use this uh, to, to kind of navigate the, the, the labor market, identify where those regions are of interest that are that might be uh, uh, more concentrated and, and more favorable to recruit from across the country. Uh, and we obviously can see some labor trends in this uh, view as well on this side here. So that that's an overview of, uh, of this view. And that kind of concludes the summary of all the views. Uh, uh, and again, what we were looking for here uh, was a way uh, to access information in a much better uh, way uh, where the user of the information is the author of their inquiries. And uh, we hope that this, this tool uh, is, is the first step in helping us uh, provide more valuable uh, and timely information to uh, mining uh, LMI users across the country. So that uh, uh, concludes the dashboard. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to uh, hit end on this. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, that was the that concludes our presentation, actually, as well. Uh, and uh, I got through all the things at the beginning of uh, the first slide, the plan. So that started with the COVID stuff uh, and then ended with the uh, presentation of the dashboard. I will uh, now open uh, the discussion to questions. I have received two questions, uh, which I'll go through right now. Um, so the first one is, do you know how mining employment has performed in 2021 since your report was published? Uh, and that's a good question because uh, obviously when we published a report, we knew full well that we were uh, 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 having a stance and a position on something that was not completely finished and, uh, and we wouldn't un completely appreciate the impact of COVID probably for a, a while, even now, uh, probably for a few years. So uh, we decided that uh, that's, that's the way it had to be. So, uh, but what we did, do and what I have mentioned is I said that I would uh, that we would keep monitoring the situation because because uh, our main stance is is that we're still in this period of unknown uh, and that there are daily events and the news cycle is completely shaping the way the way this is uh, evolving uh, even today so uh, what what I did was I pulled some stats I don't have all the way up to the current uh, picture, but uh, I, I, I had I had some stats written down, and I'm just I'm reviewing those. So in two one two, that unemployment, and remember what happened there. It went uh, up, and then it recovered, and then it it started going into this uh, weird, we don't know where it's going to be pattern. Um, so since then, uh, it went uh, back down, and then 
in March uh, of this year, uh, it went uh, back up. Uh, so it went up to 8% in March. Uh, the previous March, it was at 3%. So we're, you know, again, we're still in the turbulence phase. I think that's the, the takeaway there. Um, employment, we are comparable to last year uh, in terms of employment. Um, and that was as of March. Uh, for 213 though, uh, again, I, I, I tie this into that who has been disrupted uh, question. Uh, uh, so support services, I call sorry, I call them by their industry codes. So the support services sector uh, was clearly hit very hard by this pandemic. Uh, what we're seeing when we look at the numbers and we keep monitoring is that this hit has been more or less permanent. Uh, they have not yet recovered yet. Uh, so before uh, they were, uh, uh, they were, let's see, they were averaging 85,000 in Q1 of 2020 and they're down to 70,000 in Q1 of 2020. 20, 2021, I believe. So they haven't not yet recovered, basically, is, is, is what I'm trying to say. And their unemployment has hovered around 10% as of Q1 2021. So that's still very high. Uh, and that, that sector in particular has not, has not managed to bounce back as, as well. Um, same thing with those with no college uh, degree or diploma. Uh, th their uh, unemployment is still hovering very high as of Q1 2021. Uh, so that that get, overall that tells you that we're still in the turbulence phase. Um, second question that I had: so where can I access the dashboard? So um, that's a great question. So we put the dashboard on our website, um, and if you go click on LMI, uh, and uh, maybe I can go to it. Um, so if you go to our website. and click on that and you go to labor market information and you see this this tab here uh interactive dashboard that will take you to the dashboard and we are also in the process of of uh tweaking it so that it uh uh it's more user friendly and uh, and we're sort of playing around with the interface of it and uh so it, it's uh, like i said it's going to continue continue to evolve and we're just gonna keep getting better and stronger at, at providing uh, this data. So, um, so far that's all the questions I have. Um, so if there's no further questions, that concludes my uh, presentation for today. Oh, I have a new question. Um, so the question says how have or I get, I'm guessing it says, have you noticed any labor migration patterns across Canada recently? Uh, is is labor going to a particular province? Um, uh, that's not something uh, that we have monitored, so I I, I can't answer that question. Uh, I don't know. I also think that uh, migration patterns. If you're talking about uh, there's that that comes in two flavors. One is people not moving their residence but moving their place of work or people moving their residence and their place of work. Um, and if it is the latter, that's gonna take much more time uh, than one year. And the statistics usually compare it across five years. So they ask you, where were you five years ago? So that's not something, what I'm trying to say is that's a longer term uh, trend that we would have to get longer, more data, more time has to pass to really appreciate that. In terms of mobility, uh, yeah, that's not something we've we've really tracked, but that's definitely a very interesting uh, question. So, uh, does anybody have in attendance have any more questions? Okay. Well then, uh, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for for uh, your attendance of this presentation. I very much appreciate it. It's a privilege to be able to share uh, this work with you, and uh, and very happy to uh, uh, ha have that privilege. So thank you very much. I'm going to uh, end the meeting. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me. Um, I, I can, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions offline. Thank you. Bye bye.